Uh, this is joint work with uh, Jugaita, Negria, Hagafam, and Kisti. These are some colleagues at University of Toronto and Element AI. So, uh, this, so this, this schedule is set. I was going to talk about mutual information balance. So I'm going to get there. I just wanted to uh, sort of put this work in the context of understanding generalization more broadly and uh, use the opportunity to talk about the role of data uh, and non vacuous bounds. All right, so what might the theory of generalization offer deep learning? So by the theory of generalization, I mean statistical learning theory. So I mean building uh, basically confidence in intervals for risk and, and using these bounds, uh, kind of reading the tea leaves to, 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 to think about uh, the nature of generalization, understand, okay, what properties need to be there for these algorithms to perform well. So I'm talking about a very specific uh, set of like technical tools in statistical learning theory. So one thing you might uh, expect them to offer is explanation. So uh, uh, we, we look at these bounds, we hope that they explain the, uh, they might explain the empirical generalization performance we see in practice. Uh, and if this prediction is good, if this, uh, this explanation is good enough, we might even be able, be able to predict uh, what's going to happen if we make a modification to our learning algorithm or use this information to design better algorithms. Uh, and if this ability to predict is strong enough, then we might even, then learning theory might even offer us prescription in the sense that we can use it to directly improve generalization, design new algorithms, et cetera. Uh, now I want to suggest that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the mathematics that's built and, and sold as explanation really is just suggesting uh, it's offering suggestion. So, uh, first of all, uh, so viewed as bounds, so these are bounds on quantities between, say, zero and one, because we're talking about bounding the frequency of error. So if these bounds are, say, empirically found on standard data sets and standard neural architectures to return numbers that are greater than one, then mathematically as a bound, this doesn't tell us anything. Now, you can still, it's still typical to look at these quantities that are in these bounds that, that are no longer meaningful as bounds and to look at how these numbers, which are no longer really meaningful as bounds, correlate with, uh, cor correlate with say, performance in experiments. Uh, and, you know, and this is a very, uh, very difficult thing to do right. You have to think very carefully about the nature of the empirical study and whether you're studying uh, correlation or whether you're teasing out causation, et cetera. And there needs to be a lot more attention on this, on this aspect of this uh, type of um, experiment. Um, and at the same time, uh, not only do these bounds n not directly tell you anything about generalization, but they might tell you, they, though they might tell you something through these, through these post hoc studies, um, because the bounds are so loose, if you try to start designing algorithms based upon literally, literally the bounds, then you're going to get um, horrible, horrible underfitting because the, the bound is going to, it's so loose, it thinks its performance is much worse than it is, and so you over regularize. Um, now, in practice, what you do is you are inspired by the bound. You see some quantities in there. You throw them into your regularizer, and then you cross-validate, and that saves you. So that cross-validation step is essential to getting algorithms at work. And of course, you didn't really, even really need the theory to add some new term to your regularization and cross-validate. You can do that with almost anything, and you'll get something that, say, uh, works reasonably well. So you might ask, like, why, why is this a state of things? And I would say that... Um, well, first of all, I'll say that there is an enormous amount of work here that is, forms the foundations of anything that's done. Uh, and that, that work is essential. So I'm really just here criticizing maybe um, uh, the leap from saying, okay, here's a bound to, and this explains what's going on. We are, I would say that there's, there's fundamental math being done, but we are still far from explaining. Uh, and, and one aspect of what goes on that is maybe problematic is that there, there is a development of non-asymptotic bounds, which is sort of like the, and often high probability bounds, and this is sort of like the gold standard. Uh, but then when people evaluate these bounds, they are looking at the asymptotics of these non-asymptotic bounds. And that one twist there kind of, kind of forgives everyone from, uh, uh, or you know, it means we miss that gap. We don't really understand the, the last piece of the puzzle, or maybe the bulk of the puzzle. Uh, so, so here, here is a, a statement of like an open problem, and it might, it might surprise you that I'm considering this to be an open problem. So uh, just to set some notation, consider a training sample uh, S. Uh, I'm, gonna be talking about, I'm going to be talking about stochastic gradient descent, so I need some randomness. So I'll, I'll expose that as a random ra variable U. And then I have H hat, which is the neural network that I learned running stochastic gradient descent on my sample and the source of randomness. All right. And let's imagine that I'm running it in a regime where I kind of uh, uh, 
uh, no on standard benchmarks, then I'm going to end up getting 1% train error. All right, so here's two goals. Um, or here's the main goal in the open problem. So identify a function uh, psi and provide a proof that with probability at least 1 minus delta on the IID training set, um, you have a bound on the risk. And the size is allowed to depend on the hyperparameters of SGD, the, the sample, the randomness, and the confidence parameter. All right. Uh, so in other words, uh, this psi is a kind of 1 minus delta upper confidence band on the risk. Right? So this is a kind of st standard structure you learn and study in statistical learning theory. And at the same time, I want this valid confidence band, upper, upper confidence band, to be uh, better than guessing rate on standard benchmarks. Right? So this is, we are far from this point. Um, and uh, so that's an open problem. Now, it might, so just I want to highlight, this might be impossible. It might be the case that SGD is so wild that there's no chance of getting a bound that's better than guessing rate uh, on standard benchmarks. And so that mean, that's about adding potentially more things to this risk bound, all right? Uh, for, for example, functionals of the distribution. So maybe there needs to be some data dependence here beyond the knowledge of how this SGD algorithm ran. Now, I can quickly get a tautology by uh, putting right here uh, the distribution of this functional. All right, so uh, you have to be careful. And that's essentially, that's the name of the game when you have a held out test set bound. Right, so if I save some data off to the side and use that at the end of training, then I get a bound of this form, and that's good. And what I've done is I've put in a functional here which makes this whole endeavor sort of trivial. And so it's very, you have to be very cautious adding in functionals, but it might well be necessary. Uh, and then I'll just hint one, one more point, which is we're, we're starting to play with in our re mo most recent work with uh, Jagaita, which is that um, if your bound depends on functionals, then you may need to have some held out data to estimate them. And that is not cheating, because we are trying to understand generalization. We're not necessarily trying to build a model selection scheme, et cetera. So the name of the game changes quite a bit when you're designing algorithms, and you have this one sample, and you want to make maximal use of it, and when you're understanding. And you potentially want to have bounds with functionals of your distribution that you want to estimate. All right? So let me press on. So now, th this, there's, a, there's a number of barriers here um, I want to highlight. So there, there are three kind of types of barriers uh, I've broken these down into three types of areas, so statistical, computational, and analytical. Um, so by statistical, I mean basically the barrier that is uh, we want to understand the performance of these algorithms on real uh, data sets, and we don't know the distributions from which these data were drawn, um, even if that isn't, you know, and we can kind of squint our eyes if they're not really IID data sets like most image data sets say. Um, so it may well be the case that the bulk of the generalization performance that we see is down to nice properties of the distributions we're working with, all right? In which case, actually, we could probably safely ignore the problem of getting non-vacuous bounds, of completely understanding the full force of generalization. We could just ignore that because if it, if it is really down to easiness, then we can ignore that and just continue to hope that we're working on easy data. But if we want to, as scientists, understand deep learning, then we have to understand the full uh, generalization story. Right. And we have this unknown distribution, and this, I call it statistical barrier because we have samples. And so we can learn about this unknown distribution through samples, potentially. Um, the computational boundaries, uh, computational um, barriers abound. So uh, we can write down e easily empirical Rademacher uh, complexity bounds that we have no hope of evaluating, and so then you have to upper bound them. And often you upper bound them uh, in distribution independent ways, maybe crude ways, and then there it goes your bound. So maybe the original empirical Rademacher bound is tight and tells the story. But then we are kind of, we have to look at this story through a computational lens and we cannot see clearly because it's too hard. Um, and there are other intractable quantities. And we'll talk about mutual informations in this talk. And then there are analytical problems, like you know, uh, a lot of theories are, oh, let's look at the curvature around the minimum. Well, maybe the surface of the minimum is like bumpy, and so the local curvature is just very steep, but if we could zoom out and have the right notion of how to smooth it, we would have the right notion of, uh, you know, a kind of an appropriate notion of curvature. All right, but we have, maybe, maybe we don't know these, maybe they haven't de been developed yet, so these are the types of things I'm talking about. All right, or maybe we're just missing the right kind of tools from statistical learning theory. So all of these can combine and make the problem of understanding generalization difficult. So in terms of non-vacuous bounds, they basically exist only for uh, uh, either algorithms that are noisy, like 
stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics. But in the case of SGD, uh, you have to do some kind of post-processing to the solution. You either compress it or you, and add some noise or vice versa. All right. Um, on the flip side, uh, there's been some progress on stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics, which I'm going to introduce now. So, uh, so stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics is described by this update rule. So this looks like uh, stochastic gradient descent, and then you add on some uh, this term here. Uh, so this is just a scaling constant to make things work out correctly. But these terms here, so epsilons are, are uh, standard Gaussian noise, standard normal noise. All right. And so when you have a uh, when you have this update, we call that stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics. These uh, this here is some kind of surrogate loss, so think like cross entropy, and it's acting on not necessarily the entire data set, but some kind of stream of independent random subsets. So these are your mini batches. All right. So uh, there's this very important paper written by Raginsky, Racklin, and Telgarski in 2017 that kind of, I, I think, uh, really set off um, a right, very exciting paper giving non asymptotic risk balance for SGLD. Now, the way that paper worked is they studied the discrete algorithm here by relating it to its continuous time to counterpart and then uh, relying upon kind of spectral properties of, of, uh, of that continuous time process. And so, as a theory for why SGLD works, it doesn't quite. When, when, can someone remind me when my time is up? So I just, I've lost track of it and I want to make sure I'm pacing. 10 minutes? 15 minutes. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, so this algorithm's analysis is carried out in what I would say an unrealistic uh, regime. So this algorithm will, like most optimization algorithms, kind of find its way to the bottom here. Or if you started off here, find its way down the bottom. But there's noise. And so that noise can kind of kick itself over here. And that noise can much more rarely kick itself over here. And so indeed, they are studying this long run behavior of this algorithm where, you know, let's assume that this is 2 thirds of the probability mass. And 2 thirds of the time, you end up here. And 1 third of the time, you end up here, right? Uh, and so th this, this uh, now this is a pretty tame picture. This is two dimensions. Now you move to uh, a million dimensions, and 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 we don't quite understand the surface and what this looks like. And the idea that that this uh, that this discrete time Markov chain is actually mixing is uh, well, it might be true. I don't know. Uh, no one's shown it, and I, I would say the onus on you to show prove it, not me to accept it. All right. So this talk is going to be building on a different approach to studying. Uh, the generalization performance of this algorithm, stochastic gradient longitudinal longi longi dynamics, and it is built on this so called sequential analysis uh, that was uh, introduced by Pensio, uh, Jog, and Lowe. And so the basic idea is rather than, rather than pretending this algorithm is going to run for an extremely long time and is going to mix as a Markov chain, we're going to understand, uh, uh, the, look at the algorithm in terms of its iterates. And not assume it's mixing. And I think actually, you know, if you know, if you've played around and looked at how optimization works in, in, in deep learning, it doesn't really mix, right? It just kind of falls, 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 falls until it hits the bottom. Um, and the, the sense in which that is mixing seems very unlikely. And and so maybe an iterative analysis is not too off. So we'll see. All right. So the starting point of this is the following bound on expected generalization error. So this is not going to be a talk about high probability bounds, but I think for um, loss, really, if you can tell a story that's not, um, if you can tell a story for the expected generalization error, then I think you, you, then, then I think that's something interesting. So, just to, just to explain my notation here, so I have a data set of n uh, IID examples. I have, say, some learned weights. So this is a random element in R D that's coupled to S, right? These are dependent because I've I've learned this from S. And then I can talk about the expected generalization error, uh, which is the expected difference between the actual risk, actual error rate of this uh, learn, learn classifier, this learn network, neural network, say, and the performance on the same data on which it was trained. Now, uh, these authors that uh, Pensia start, so, so this is the work of Jun Raginsky and Rousseau and Zhou. And the, the underlying assumption here is just a, a tame one, so I won't dwell on it. It's just this sub, -sub Gaussian. Uh, assumption. This is satisfies for say bounded loss. All right. And what the theorem says is that the the uh, the the absolute value of this expected generalization error, which is a reasonable quantity to, to study and can be easily turned into a excess risk bound, if you give me say uh, some kind of control on how good the optimiz algorithm is optimizing. 
that this uh, expected generalization error is bounded by, and I'm going to ignore most terms, the square root of the mutual information normalized by how many sam training samples you have. All right? So this is, this is a theory. This is a, this sort of a, I mean, this is coming from the information theory literature, but this is, a, you know, this is very much a result also of statistical learning theory. This says, okay, my performance can be expected to be no worse than this. So is this theory, does this theory explain S SGLD, say generalization? All right. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I th so there's no chance it explains SGD, uh, in, in my opinion, because I, th I, I, don't, I don't know how to proof, but I'm pretty sure the mutual information in SGD is going to be infinite. Right? So it can't possibly directly explain SG, SGD. Maybe you can go, maybe you can be clever and get around this. Uh, but does it explain SGLD? Well, we'd have to, we have to understand that. So if, now, if you're not familiar, familiar with mutual information, here's a relationship to KL. So let's introduce, uh, here's the conditional distribution of, say, the teeth iterate given the data set. So this is basically our learning algorithm. That is, S, that is, a, that is a probability kernel representing stochastic gradient, stochastic gradient longitudinal dynamics. And this is your marginal distribution. So this is, this is the distribution in the iterate not conditional on the data, right? So this is like the, this is the, this is the, this is the distribution for your particular data set and this is a typical output of your algorithm. And the mutual information can be written as this expected KL between these two, right? So insofar as your, your, your algorithm behaves differently because of the particular data you've been handed, then your mutual information is gonna be very large. All right, now the proof of this via Donsker or Veridin uh, suggests that things like SGLD might be reasonably well captured. Their generalization performance might be reasonably well captured by this bound. Um, now there's a, these, there, there are these statistical barriers. So I can't answer immediately whether this is going to explain generalization because this mutual information term depends on the unknown distribution. I don't know it. Um, and it, even if I did know it, um, this, this here is extremely intractable. This even here is intractable. So this KL is a KL divergence being intractable quantities. All right. Now, uh, um, all right, so how, do, how, do you, how can you make progress here? So the, the progress here was made by Pensia um, et al. And the basic idea is to, well, let's bound this. All right, so as I said, we don't, know the dis we don't know the distribution, and if we did, this term would be intractable, all right? And I already mentioned we don't care about mixing. So here was the basic idea. So this mutual information here, I've copied it down. We can uh, upper bound it by not, not computing the mutual information with the last iterate, but all iterates. And then this can be decomposed into the, the kind of contribution of the mutual information from the, the mutual information contribution for each update of the algorithm. All right, so this is the, you know, some, the third update condition on the earlier iterates. And uh, if you follow this through and you, you can bound these terms, you get this, this sort of term here, simplifies, and, and you get this bound. All right, so we, now we got our like nice one over square root of m bound, and, uh, and so are we done, right? So this term here, okay, what's this L? So this L is a upper bound on sort of the worst case gradient we ever see, all right? And uh, depending on where you do your counting, either in beta or L, basically one of these terms in the general running of SGLD is gonna be N as well. And so that N kills this N, and you have no bound. Now that was, a, that was an asymptotic analysis I just did there too. But you know, if you went and evaluated this, you would find that as well. And so this L here appearing is very problematic. All right, uh, extremely problematic. And it, actually you have a problem even if you, even if you, even if, so this L is actually a, a bound on the gradient of the average risk. So that's, so that actually it's a, it's a beta term that's gonna kill you. But, so we have a problem here. All right, so to get past this problem, we need to do better than dealing with a, uh, like a Lipschitz constant. We have to, and, and the idea is that, well, let's try to get some more distribution dependence in our bound. Because if you look at this, this, all this really depends on is like the architecture. I have no dependence on my distribution, right? So how do we get there? So the first step is to, we're gonna be talking about subsets of the data, because I, I, I need to open up and allow myself some data and so I'm going to introduce a random subset of my data, call it J. There's going to be, so I have N data points, one up to N. I'm going to choose a random subset of them. And then I'm going to split my data set into the, 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 the ones in J and the, the complement of that data set. Okay. All right, so now you get this bound. So I, I've, I've uh, attributed this also to Roginsky and Boo et al. They have a slightly better version of this, but this is really just the starting point of the story. So 
what you have now is you have the expected generalization error, not depending on the weights and the whole data set, but you only, you only kind of have mutual information between the weights and a part of the data set. And um, this bound is, uh, can, this bound, say, compared to Riginsky, this, this can be infinite when this is finite. So this is a major improvement in some cases. All right. Now to show you where we go, so you can write the mutual information as an expected disintegrated mutual information. So I'm just going to plug that in here. And then, uh, and, you know, so one of the things we do is we can show you, you can yank out that expectation. Now you can also write, say, in the, in the special case of uh, holding out a single data point. So now, now our uh, bound is a, is a bound looking at the disintegrated mutual information between a single, say, all, um, a single data point, that should not be a bar, a single data point in the weights, all right? And so it's almost like a mutual information stability notion. All right, so you can rewrite the disintegrated, disintegrated mutual information as a expectation of a KL. KL between, so these look, should look familiar, that basically this is a kernel representing SGLD, so this is, how, this is a distribution of SGLD condition on the data, and this is um, the, 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 uh, the conditional distribution given only this chunk of the data. And so then you get, you can replace this with a KL too. All right, so that's our final point. And then the interesting part is this, that this holds for all kernels p. So I have no hope of I have no hope of work, I have no hope of working with this distribution. However, I can maybe come up with something clever here. And so that's what we do. Okay? What do you mean by kernel? Uh, I mean that this thing takes in like a, ch a little chunk of data and hands back a distribution. So it's going to so in this one you give it sj, you give it the little chunk of the data and hands you back a distribution on weights. Okay? Markov kernel is it like what people sometimes call it. All right, so just as there is this uh, decomposition of mutual information to steps, there's a decomposition of KL divergence into steps. And so, okay, so we wanna write, the, we, wanna, we wanna bound the KL divergence between the distribution of SGLD and some other um, prior, say, distribution here. And we get, to choose how, we get to choose this however we like. In some sense, this thing is trying to predict this thing. And so that's the aim of the game here. So this can be upper, upper bound in the same way by saying, okay, well, I'm not gonna try to focus on the last iterate because that's intractable, so I'll focus on the entire trajectory. And so there's potentially some looseness showing up here if you believe SGLD is mixing. But if you don't believe it's mixing, then maybe there's not much looseness showing up. And this decomposes uh, as the contribution coming from, on average, each step of SGLD. So what if I, I've windowed this down to, I'm gonna bound, uh, bound this, this, uh, this divergence here in terms of my ability to predict a single step of SGLD. All right, so here, here's the guess. So here's, here's SGLD itself. So if I'm at a current iterate, um, then the way that I get to the next iterate is I look at the difference between where I am and the negative gradient and I add some Gaussian noise. This is just a rewriting of SGLD. And my prediction is, Given that I have been handed a little chunk of the data, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to use that little chunk of the data to do the best I possibly can at predicting what this is. And the best I possibly can is, well, I replace the empirical risk with my empirical risk just for the chunk of the data that I know. And then what you get is you get the KL divergence looks like this. And it depends on some parameters, but most importantly depends on this difference between the full batch gradient and the, this little, uh, the, uh, the gradient associated with this little chunk of data that you've held up. And we call this incoherence, all right? And so if you put it all together and you plug this back into the bounds that we had before in mutual information, you get these bounds. All right, so this is a bound that we have and this is sort of, sort of the closest one in the literature. And the basic difference between these two, so this term is one over n, this term is one over n, so there are square root one over n bounds. So the, the, the best bounds in the past uh, or in the literature depended on the square norm of the gradient. And what we show is that actually that is spurious. You don't de depend on the size of the gradient, depend on this sort of incoherence, the expected squared or the expected average uh, incoherence. All right, and so you know, what, kind of, what kind of difference is this? So here's a plot of that difference. So let's focus on the two lines. So this is that squared coherence and it's up near 10 to the four. So that 10 to the four is fighting your one over square root of n. All right, so you're gonna lose. Versus the incoherence was way down here, tiny. In fact, after, after first uh, epoch, it's uh, tiny. First epoch's pretty bad. Second epoch is already really, really small. 
So what, so what is this? Uh, so here's some more numbers here. So you see um, this quantity here, which is orders of magnitude larger than the incoherence term, which is way smaller. All right. And you can, so th this is, uh, this slide is somewhat, these numbers might, you might, you might, you might well, I am somewhat embarrassed to show these numbers, but they sh are also so show this kind of sorry state of how good um, bounds are. Um, so this is MNIST on a multi-layer perceptron after one epoch, two epochs, three epochs. So here's the training error, 25, 16, 12. And this is a particular configuration. We didn't really optimize this. And the, here are corresponding test classification errors. Uh, this, these are bound, this, this is a state-of-the-art bound for SGLD. And so it's, it's growing quite rapidly. Ours is growing as well. It, it's going to grow. Our bound grows over time, just like theirs. Um, but you can, see, you can see the effect of this massive difference between these two quantities here. All right. Now, uh, I don't purport to uh, suggest that uh, we understand generalization SGLD, um, but we now, you know, we have kind of extended this situations where this bound is not not vacuous, we've replaced some apparent, let me go back a slide, apparent dependence on the gradient norms by this sort of term, which is like kind of a centered version of this. We've removed this, the kind of magnitude from this picture. And now we're down to like a, something more like a variance. All right. So just concluding. All right, so I, I've introduced you to these mutual information bounds on expected generalization and asked, you know, can these bounds explain generalization? Well, we don't know these mutual information. So we have to study them. And the basic approach in literature is build a bound and, and then uh, look at what you get and see if you can interpret that as, as explaining generalization happening. Um, we build in this work of sequential decomposition of the mutual information. So we are going to lose potentially the nice effects of this Markov chain algorithm mixing. But I'm not sure if it's mixing in practice. So I'm not sure how much we're losing in practice. Those are, though our bounds in the end are extremely loose. Um, I point out that these bounds are vacuous in standard regimes. And the main culprit is this complete lack of distribution dependence. All right. And in order to get this distribution dependence back in, we have to go, we go in, we relate this mutual information to KL, and then we, then we say, ah, we can make a better prediction as to where the algorithm is going to go. And we're going to, we're going to make that prediction using the data itself. All right, and we're, and we're able to use the data itself because we have this new kind of mutual information bound. All right, now despite all this, these bounds are very loose, if non-vacuous. Um, and uh, so we know there's, there's, there's way more progress, right? Um, if you don't do that last step, you say, oh wow, I've just dramatically improved this bound. I'm explaining generalization, but no, I mean, clearly we're not explaining generalization still. And so more work needs to be done to understand whether mutual information can explain stochastic gradient longevity dynamics. Thank you.